team, I am going to do a video on conservation of energy, trying to highlight everything that we already talked about and just making it as simple as possible for you to understand heading towards the WPR. So let's start off with understanding mechanical energy. Mechanical energy has to do with not only the motion of the object, of an object, it has to do with the position of that object. It is a combination of those two. Understanding that energy is formed with the motion and also referring to the potential of that object's energy due to its position. So let's talk a little bit about um, the, the different types of energy. Let's start off with kinetic translational energy, which equals one half mass times velocity squared. It's the mass of the object times the velocity of that object as it's hitting over, as it's moving. So one thing that to notice is that whenever you see an object, let's put it as a circle, whenever you see an object that's moving in any direction whatsoever, if it's moving in any direction whatsoever, that object has kinetic energy because kinetic energy is the energy due to motion. Just remember that. So like it, anything that you see in motion has to have kinetic energy. Now, secondly, let's start off with talking about rotational kinetic energy. Now, rotational kinetic energy is very similar to the translational one um, in terms of this is angular velocity and this is rotational inertia. That is the same thing for mass. It is the, equiv the equivocal of kinetic translational energy. Now, the thing about it is that whenever you have kinetic translational energy, it's not only about it's not about the motion itself or the direction it's going, it's about the rotation. If you see any object that is rotating, that means that it has some type of kinetic rotational energy, okay? So keep that in mind. So if you ever see a cylinder or a ball moving, it, or like they're saying like, hey, it has, it's rotating and there is no slip. No slip and it's completely rotating it means that, hey, this ball is rotating and it has kinetic rotational energy. Now, the third part, potential energy. Potential gravitational energy goes as mass times gravity times height. Notice that the word potential, it has the potential to do work. So if you're holding a block here and the floor is right here, it has the potential to do energy, to do work. However, once you release it, that's when it starts converting into from potential energy to kinetic energy because now you're having the object moving. It is falling down, it is moving downwards, whereas before you were just holding it. This doesn't mean that immediately it turns into kinetic translational energy. Like it is, every time that you continues moving, it's a little bit less potential energy and more kinetic translational energy until it falls into the floor and it completely turns into, um, it, it completely turns zero uh, for, potential, for potential gravitational energy, okay? So we've talked about that. Let's talk about the last one, which is potential spring, uh, spring potential energy, which goes as one half k x squared. So the k is the spring constant. Spring constant. And the x is how much the spring has been compressed And that would dictate the spring potential energy. So how would this work? So let's say that we have a spring right here. It's not my best artwork, I know. We have a spring right here attached to a wall, right? It is completely normal. It hasn't been compressed at all. Right now, the spring potential energy is zero because there is the, the X here represents how much the spring has been compressed. And it is a normal state and is right now, there's no compression involved. 
So that means that there is no spring potential energy. However, if there was a block moving in and completely compresses the spring right here, that distance from where the spring was originally at to where the spring ended, that is X. So it's holding, it's called potential, spring potential energy because it's holding that energy right there. It's not moving, it is like, it's, a, it's like about to burst. So that's why if it decompresses and it pushes the block away, it's pushing the block away, again, that energy translates into another type of mechanical energy and that type is kinetic translational energy for this example because it is moving this way so it is translating from spring potential energy to kinetic translational energy like think about potential as like it has the potential to do some type of, like to convert some type of energy and that type of energy is usually for our examples kinetic translational energy okay so we talked about the energies but we haven't really talked about what this means the work due to non-conservative forces equals the final mechanical energy minus the initial mechanical energy just think of it as this it's like i we only care about when it comes to energy it's like what happens at the very beginning let's let me put an example like this like this is a cylinder and this is the very beginning, the beginning, initial. And it has an initial velocity. And right here, it goes all the way down and it has a final velocity. We only care about what happens at the very beginning here and at the very end here. So, when we have to identify all the types of energies that are going on initially and all the types of energies that are going on at the final. When we're talking about kinetic translational, there is kinetic translational because there is a velocity, the initial velocity here. Um, so we'll put in, hey, there is an initial velocity for this object here. And let's say that there also is a final velocity for this object here. Okay? But, check this out, it also has a height. So we have to identify, I'll put a kinetic translational potential. We also have to identify, let me erase this. What was this change in height? So if this is H, and right here, the height here is zero, it means that initially, it had a potential gravitational energy of H, right here, of mass times gravity times H. But once it got here to the final, it got to zero because there is no longer a, a potential gravitational energy, okay? Now, let's say that it is, there is rotation involved, kinetic rotational energy. If the object is moving and is, you know, it is a cylinder and it's clearly stating that it's, it is rotating, it also, it, is also, it also has kinetic rotational energy at the very beginning, initial. And it also has, at the end, since it is still moving, the object is still moving. It also has kinetic rotational energy, sorry, kinetic rotational energy at the end as well. So you have to keep in mind that if it's moving, that ball is moving, yes, like, and the ball is moving and it's clearly stating that it's rotating. It's like, you have to identify this as also that is rotational kinetic energy at the very beginning and there's also a rotational energy at the very at the, the very end now if the ball said if the example said hey 
the object is at rest at the beginning, that means that there is no kinetic translational energy at the beginning, and there is no kinetic rotational energy at the beginning as well. This is partly due because of a link equation. If you look at your PRC, your PRC shows that the tangential velocity is equal to the radius of that object times the angular velocity, okay? If there is a tangential velocity, in this case, this is initial, velocity initial, or velocity final, there is sure to be an initial angular velocity, and there's also going to sure to be an initial final velocity. And you can find these by understanding the radius, understanding that there is a radius, and you can solve for that. Velocity final over r equals final angular velocity. So that is the link between kinetic ro rotational energy and kinetic translational energy. Okay? So we have identified all these and the, th the thing that we have to do is now that we have identified all these we have to sum these up. So E final is equal to one half mass times velocity final squared plus one half rotational inertia times angular velocity squared or final velocity squared plus zero because there's no potential gravitational energy there's also no spring uh, potential energy for this example as well um, and then e initial would be you notice that i'm just summing the things together the things that I have identified together. So one mass, velocity initial squared, plus one half moment of inertia, angular velocity squared, plus mass times gravity times the height, okay? And the rest is very straightforward where now that I've identified this, these two, I can subtract mechanical energy, final mechanical energy, and final in, or initial mechanical energy. Say it again, final mechanical energy minus initial mechanical energy. And if there is conservation of energy in this problem, or like in this example, the work due to non-conservative forces, once you subtract those two, should equal to zero. If there is some type of constant number that comes out of it, it means that there is some work due to non-conservative force due to friction, due to friction, thermal, sound, anything that has been transferred that is unusable after it initially did the, the motion from point A to point B, okay? So hopefully this has helped a little bit before going into the actual example. Uh, I will talk about the work due to non-conservative forces in another video, but let's hit straight to the quiz that we, that we did last time. Okay, so reading the problem. A basketball model as a thin spherical shell. Thin spherical shell. Starts from rest on a curved ramp, a curved ramp at point A where A, the H is this value, and the basketball rolls without slipping down, no slip, the ramp to point B. At point B, the basketball has a translational and speed of 3.46 meters per second final velocity calculate the height of the model of the basketball at point b okay so first of all let me be clear about one thing about kinetic rotational energy if they give you a moment of inertia simply go to your prc go to this place right here Check out the description that they give you on the on the actual on the actual problem, and look for 
the things that describe your model. So if it's a thin spherical shell about any diameter, what we're looking at for this problem is this moment of inertia or rotational inertia, okay? It's a thin spherical shell. Just remember that that if usually they'll give you so they'll give you the actual the actual thing the object description and you can look at that description your PRC to find the moment of inertia of the kinetic translational energy. All right, so let's start off with the problem. Okay, so first things first, you want to make sure that you identify this problem as some type of conservation of energy problem. Physics, COE. Just write it down, COE. Write down work due to non-conservative forces is equal to the final mechanical energy minus initial mechanical energy. Okay, just to be on the safe side. You have identified this problem to be a conservation of energy problem. Now, in order to continue with your success, I highly recommend that you also identify immediately the equations that you will need for this problem. So it's saying that it starts from rest, but then it starts moving at translational speed. So you know off the bat that it has a translational speed and it's moving. It means that this is an important factor, the kinetic translational energy. Secondly, it's saying that the basketball rolls. That is another extremely humongous hint. The basketball rolls. So there is a kinetic rotational energy as well. So write it down. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, but we have height. We have height here and we have height here. So that means that Somewhere down the line, we need to use potential gravitational energy. That goes as mass times gravity times height. And your PRC is shown as mass times gravity times Y. But honestly, it is just height. Don't confuse yourself. Just use H. Okay? So you have identified the most important equations for this one. Another humongous hint. If it does not say that there is no, that it's, it does not say that there is uh, work due to non-conservative forces, like if it does not say that there's any friction, uh, any friction involved or any like work due to non-conservative forces, a, a loss of energy or anything to that effect, it means that the work due to non-conservative forces is zero. Like if it does not specifically tell you that there is work due to non-conservative forces, or like there is friction involved, then yes, you can assume that this work due to non-conservative forces is zero, okay? So the work due to non-conservative forces is zero. Okay, so the next thing involved is that I want you to understand that when it comes to conservation of energy, when it comes to energy in itself, it is path independent. I don't care what happens here or here or here. What matters is what happens at the, in the initial state and the final state. Okay? So, now that we have identified the initial and the final state, we can start doing our table. Tables are extremely important for the WPR. So please consider doing the tables in the WPR because it not only helps the grader, you want to make sure that you explicitly tell the grader what you're thinking because um, if you don't show some type of work, you might lose points if your answer is wrong at the end, okay? So we have to do a table here. Final mechanical energy initial mechanical energy Where did that, or yeah and that's it you know that the subtraction of these two will equal zero because you're assuming that so let's start off with the initial 
Initially, it just told us that it's at rest. So we put in kinetic translational energy. It's zero initially because it starts at rest. But it finds a footing, it finds a translational speed at the end, so we can write down one half mass times velocity final squared. Now, remember what I told you, if the kinetic translational energy and kinetic rotational energy are connected due to the, uh, to the equation of, v ten, of tangential velocity times radius time or is equal to but tangential velocity is equal to radius times angular velocity okay so they're connected to each other if there is no tangential velocity or in this case vert initial velocity then there is no angular velocity as well angular velocity is zero therefore there is no rotational energy rotational kinetic energy at the very beginning okay so now let's go to the end at the end there is a speed a final speed so that means that there is a final rotational kinetic energy finally we have potential energy on both the initial and the final. Notice that we have potential energy at height A, because that is still identified at height. We have identified that height, that once we get to here, the potential energy is zero. Once we get to this bottom, potential energy is zero. But for the meantime, to identify height B, we have to identify that this potential energy is zero. So height B would be mass times gravity times height B for the potential energy at the end. Now, the few things that we can do is put them together. We know that this translates into final minus initial equals zero. And we can just start summing these two over here and over here. So we have one half mass times velocity, final velocity squared, plus one half in it, uh, rotational inertia times angular velocity squared, plus mass times gravity times height b is e or not equal, but minus because now we're in this section right here. We finished summing up all the mechan the final mechanical energy, and now we're going to the initial mechanical energy. The initial mechanical energy, there's only mass times gravity times height A is equal to zero. So we're almost done. Notice that they didn't give us, we didn't give us the radius, but there's for a reason. We have to identify height B but we don't have all the variables yet. We were given, we were given height A, we were given final velocity, we were given um, the mass, and apart from that, that is, as much, that is as much as we can work with. We also know that initial velocity is zero. So, Given that we have all these components, like let's see how everything plays out. We, might, we need to make sure that everything translates into what we have already. So we have velocity, we have mass, we don't have moment of inertia, and we don't have angular velocity. So we have to convert these into a different type of equation. Just like I told you, go to your PRC, and find out the rotational inertia for a spherical, a spherical uh, shell, and that would be two thirds (parenthesis two thirds) mass times the radius squared. Now, also remember the equation for angular velocity: tangential velocity is equal to r times angular velocity. If you move the r to the other side. you're left with this equation. So you know 
tangential velocity because tangential velocity is the final velocity, the one that was given to you for the final angular velocity. So we can rewrite this as mass times velocity squared plus, oh, why am I doing that? Just continue working here. So that would be final velocity over r squared. Notice, let me actually highlight it in red so you can see the difference. It's basically plugging in the angular velocity the equation for the angular velocity and the equation for the moment of inertia okay plus mass times gravity times height b minus mass times gravity times height a equals zero so since these are squared r squared r squared i can cancel these out so r squared over r squared cancels out fantastic so all i'm left now is v velocity final squared i can also cancel out the masses because the masses are in the same components here 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 i can pull these out and cancel them because they are in the same components and they're it's just too easy just to plug them out or divide by mass and you'll see that each one of them just disappears okay so you have to divide by mass here too but it disappears perfect okay so what your left is one half velocity squared final plus See, cancel this out. One third velocity squared final. Not as everything cancels out in this component, so all I'm left is this. And then plus gravity times height b minus gravity times height a equals zero. Now all I have to do now is solve for b. If we solve for B, you can, at this point, if you want, if you want to replug your values in it, go for it. Just be careful. Don't mess up algebraically, okay? So if you want to compare it, so like if you want to plug it in, but at this point now, since you have velocity, you have height A, gravity, acceleration due to gravity is given to you. Um, I, also, I made a bad mistake. Mass wasn't given to you in the givens, but it worked out just fine because it still canceled out. Okay? All you have to do now is solve for H. Make sure, I'm telling you, make sure that you at least attempt to solve for, for the value that, that we're looking for. Like, that will propel you at a different level um, that at least will let us understand that you know that you have to solve for this specific value and like that will give you some credit okay so at the end of the day I believe the answer is 1.29 yep 1.29 meters that is the final answer for it notice make sure that your sig figs are correct Six figs are correct. And make sure that your unit is correct. That, my students are constantly calling me out for that. I mess that up all the time too. I don't want you to mess it up. You're, you're the ones on the table being graded. So I, I just want you to be successful. So hopefully this class has been helpful for you for the conservation of energy, okay? Uh, I will continue doing videos, but this is the first that I, that I have. All right, so I'll see you guys soon. Uh, take care and have a blessed day.